right. So in this lecture, I'm going to introduce a, a, the tutorial of the data storage. So there are flip flops, latches, and uh, ROMs, which is read-only memory. And these are being used not just here, but also in uh, one of the following um, tutorials. I forgot which one. Soft core, yes. So you use the ROM to store the instructions for the CPU. Uh, so it is able to find out the instruction at a specific address to um, execute the instruction in the CPU. And so Thursday, there's no lecture. So you'll keep working on the data storage tutorial. And also Thursday, during the lab, you are supposed to work on the lab from last week. It's a two-week lab. So first, if you look at this latch, it's a SR latch. So the latch we learn in logic, you use the NAND gates, but this one is a NOR gate latch. Does that matter? So if you look at R and S, is R resetting Q? If you give a one to R and a zero to S, is Q being reset? Um, so there are all different kind of schematic for the for the latches and flip flops. So if you look at this one, it's different from the ones we uh, you guys learned. It's right? so the NOR gate, but it also works. Let's verify it really quick. If I have Zero for R, one for S, what's gonna happen? So the NAND gate, um, no, I mean, for the, for the bottom one, the NOR gate here, one is gonna give you a zero to the output of the NOR gate, and zero comes back to the input of the top NOR gate. So zero, zero, NOR, you're getting a one. So whenever S is one, or you can say when S is being turned on, it's setting Q. Okay, if you give a R a one and S a zero, and you are getting zero for Q and one for Q naught. So even though it's using a different gate, um, but it's doing the same job. And also the top one, the top one here, the top input here is R, the bottom input is S. It's not changing anything. So this is just one example because there are many other flip-flops like this one, you know, it looks totally different from the ones you have seen. It's just doing the same job. So just let you know there are different architectures for the flip-flops. Okay. Um, that's a gate level circuit. And if you just use, just look at the structure of the circuit, you can definitely write the Verilog code for it. So there are a couple of different ways to model it in Verilog. Structural modeling, you can just directly look at the you know, structure of the flip flop, NOR gate, input, input, output, NOR gate, input, input, output. No, output. Um, yeah, input, input, output. Um, that's not right. So the first one is output. The second one and third one, these are inputs. Right. But usually I do not use a structural modeling. Okay. Now sometimes you have a NOR gate, uh, this kind of function in Verilog. And for uh, for other uh, logic blocks, you probably don't have that specific function available for us to use. So I, I wouldn't I I won't recommend this one. Uh, data flow modeling uh, and the behavioral modeling these are more uh, often used. This is very straightforward. Just assign these inputs with the operators to this output. Uh, and the second one is also very straightforward. 
for behavioral modeling. Sometimes we have always add the, the rising edge or the pause edge of the clock. But now, you know, sometimes you can have other signal lines in the processes. What does that mean? I don't think I, I mentioned that in the, in the past. So these are called the sensitivity list. So these are, the, these are the signals being used as a sensitivity list. Uh, whenever these signals changes, it's going to execute the always block. You can have one signal here or multiple signals here at the same time. So S and R, these are the sensitivity, these are in the sensitivity list. So when S is one, so if S means when S is one, assign one zero to Q and QN. I think I talked about that in, in uh, microcontrollers. So for the SR flip flop, Q is always copying S. Remember, it's just sending S to Q. That's why when S is one, Q should be one. So Q is one. Mm -hmm. Else if R, when R is one, Q becomes zero because it's resetting the circuits, resetting the result. So Q should be zero. And QN becomes one. Any problem with this behavioral modeling? For the ISR flip flop, it's not a flip flop yet. So it's, it's a latch. Sorry, it's a latch. It's not a flip flop. It's because it's not clocked. So it's not controlled by a clock. It's just a latch, right? Combinational block. So, is there any issue with this behavioral modeling? It, it is assuming that S and R, they are inverted to each other. So if S is one, R must be zero. If R is one, S must be, must be zero. Right? Why? Because in the condition here, it only, uh, only looks at, looks at uh, S, but not R. So R is not being uh, checked. So when S is one, it assumes that R is must be zero. Um, so when, I mean, how 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 control that? It came from the user, right? So the user, it it's, it must trust the user to give a when S is one, R must be zero, or when um, S is zero, R must be one. You know. So this is just trying to model the SR latch over here. It's not a perfect, not a perfect model, um, but it works. So it's just want to make sure that when you are designing the test bench, you don't want to give a one one to the inputs or zero zero to the inputs because it doesn't have that functionality to uh, to check it inside the model. Okay, so here is the test bench. So, so here's the model, here's the test bench. So we are assigning values to S and R. We just give a one zero or zero one to them. So what is zero zero and one one as the inputs? You look at choose table. For the, for the Norge, SR latch. One one is not used. So the user shouldn't give one one to SNR forever. It shouldn't give one one here. Why? Yeah, because it's it's all putting what? Zero zero to Q and Q not at the same time. It's one, one here, whatever here is, it's going to give a, one, a zero here. And it's same here as well. Just killing these two NOR gates. 
So it's an invalid input. So it should never give one one to the inputs. Uh, so what is zero zero? What's the state of zero zero? If you give zero zero here, what's happening? It's a memory. So Q the, is the next state of Q equals uh, the last state of Q. It's not changing anything. So zero zero is being used in this NOR gate uh, SR latch, but one one is not being used. It's an invalid uh, input. All right. So during the simulation for the test bench, you only need uh, the two types of inputs. I only need to test two of them. Uh, if I want to try, probably not, since I don't have that functionality described in the in the model here. Yeah, just follow the tutorial though. Um, SR flip flop. Is this an edge trigger flip flop or is a level trigger flip flop? Why, why, is, why shouldn't it be an add triggered? These are all combinational blocks. These are just gates. You don't have any. You don't have a switch in any of the gates. So whenever this one is high, whenever C is high or clock when C is high, these two AND gates are enabled. So whenever you have a valid logic input here and here. It's going to send the output to Q and Q naught immediately, so there's no switch in between. So it's level trigger. This is the truth table of it. So compared to the ledge, uh, in terms of the Verilog modeling, this one is very simple. You just need to add another uh, signal line into the sensitivity list, which is C. Just add it. Just add it there. It's very simple. D latch or D flip flop. This is the level trigger D flip flop. So D flip flop is very similar to the SR flip flop. It only has one input. So D is being inverted. Um, so that signal being supplied to the AND gate as R and D is S. So if you look at this schematic and then come back to this schematic, so AND gate, NOR gate, AND gate, NOR gate, only difference is D becomes, so S becomes D and the signal being inverted to replace uh, to replace the signal R. So why D is here, not here, I'm not on the top. So what is the reason that D should be here, but not on the top? And then I invert the signal, invert D, and fit it into this AND gate. Why D must be here? If you come back to this one, so remember I have been saying that. So the SR flip flop is sending what to Q? S to Q, right? So the D flip flop is a data flip flop. So it's a data flip flop means whatever in D should be sent to Q because that's the data, right? Because as it's been being sent to Q, that's why this this pin here must be D because D is being sent to Q as well. It's very easy to model. The D flip flop, and this is a schematic of the edge triggered D flip flop. So the question is, why is this is edge triggered, not level triggered, compared to the last one? So these are level triggered DFI flops, one, two, 
and you combine them together and make the connection like this, it becomes an edge triggered deep flip flop. It's not a not a level triggered uh, deep flip flop anymore. So because when clock when clock becomes high, this one is enabled. So the signal here will be passed to here because this is a level trigger DP flop, right? Okay, so the signal will be passed to here. But this one is disabled because when clock is high, this becomes low. So this is disabled, so the data cannot be sent to here. However, at the falling edge, at the falling edge, what's going to happen? This one is enabled, so the data stored here will be sent to here. But this one is disabled, so whenever the input changes, won't affect the output over here. So that's why it's being sampled. And it's called an uh, add trigger because the level is not going to pass the D to the final output anymore. It only happens at the edge. So how do you model it? Add trigger D3 flop, and here's a Verilog code for it. And it's also it's also adding a clear function. So when the clear function, when the clear uh, when this signal line is zero, it's just clear clearing up the the Q, which is the output. So Q becomes zero and Q not becomes one. So if clear is not zero, when which means clear is one, it's not clearing up the output. D assigned to Q and D not assigned to QN. And this is a uh, edge trigger because it only happens at the edge. So we don't have to dig into the details of, uh, of the circuit because the always block is already the edge trigger D3 flop. It's only happening at the uh, rising edge of the clock. Yeah, I run the simulation. JK for SR flip flop is sending S to Q. For JK flip flop, it is sending J to Q. Just keep in mind. So the JK flip flop, this is definitely not the only schematic for the JK flip flop. And if you short J to K, to K and um, send the signal uh, voltage high to that signal line, to the shorted signal line. It's getting a T flip flop. So T flip flop means toggle flip flop. Whenever the clock rising edge arrives, it's going to toggle Q. So it's being used as a counter, uh, as part of the counter. So that's a Verilog code. So if you look at, so just trying to model the JK flip flop is actually very simple. If you look at G and K, so if G and K is zero one, it is sending. J to Q, which means it should be 0, 1. This Q is 1, Q is the same as J, so J is 0, Q is 0. So nice to have Verilog, right? So it's, it's been, it's going to take you like probably five hours to connect everything in LT Spice or somewhere else. Right now, I just need to describe it. I just want this to happen whenever the clock arrives. You don't even need, need to think about the, the details of the circuit. You don't need to understand the circuit. So like I said, you just need to remember that. So the SR flip flop is sending S to Q. JK flip flop is sending K to Q. That's it. So whenever JK is zero one, because J is zero, Q must be zero and Q one must be one. And when JK is one zero, Q and Q naught should be one zero. And when JK are, uh, is 1, 1, when JK is 1, 1, like what I said, if you short J to K and connect that signal line to voltage high, it's a T flip flop. 
you can convert a JT flip-flop to a T flip-flop. So a T flip-flop is a toggle flip-flop. Whenever the clock arrives, the rising edge arrives, it's gonna to toggle the elbow. So how to toggle it? You look at the Verilog description over here. Is this toggling the Q and Q knot? Yes. You're assigning Q knot to Q, and Q to Q knot, so it's toggling that output. Yeah, just need you just need a one line to form a T flip flop. Okay, so here it comes the T flip flop, toggle flip flop. So this is a JK flip flop for the uh, to form a T flip flop, and this is the section just for a T flip flop. It's not doesn't have any JK function anymore. So it's totally just a T flip flop. So if T as an input is if T is zero, is grounded, then it's not changing the output, it's performed like a memory. So what Q was, it should be the same value um, as a past state. If T is one, it should toggle Q every, at every clock rising, rising edge of the clock. So does that make sense? I mean, what about this one? T flip flop, right? So when clear is one, uh, when clear is zero, it should clear up everything. But when clear is not zero, so it's functional, the T flip flop is working. So Q, X or T. And assign to Q. So when T is one, the toggling functionality is being activated. And one, Q X or one, so it's actually anything X or one is what? It, it's, it's a very, it's a common, like a common sense. It's being used everywhere in, in, in digital logic. When anything X or one, so a, a data can be either zero or one, right? So if one X or one, what's the result? No, zero, they are the same. So for the XOR logic, if the two inputs are the same, you're getting zero, right? Okay, if the input is zero, so zero XOR one is what? One. Okay, so what's happening here? If you, if a signal being XOR with one, what's happening? Yeah, you are toggling the, the, the signal. So if you X or zero, what's happening? It's not changing the, the signal. If zero X or zero is still zero, one X or zero is still one. Yeah, still the original signal. It's not changing it. So that's why this one is toggling it. Q, X or T. Because the T is a variable, right? So we don't know what is the T. So the one that you have to use not Q, assigned to Q, because T can be zero. So you can directly just X or T. Whenever T is one, it's toggling. Whenever T is zero, it's not changing anything. So that's exactly the true stable, what the true stable has. Make sense? Register, so deeply flopped, uh, edge triggered, rising edge triggered. It's parallel in, parallel out. Memory, so section six and section seven, these are just introduction sections. Uh, I don't have any tasks associated with these two section sections, which means you won't, you won't read it. <laughs> ROM, so this is a big part of the tutorial and uh, very important. So the previous ones are just for uh, practice. And this is very useful. It's being used uh, for one of the following tutorials as well. Read-only memory, address data, read, enable, chip, enable. These are the ports, the ports of the memory block. So it's literally just the finding, uh, so these data are being stored if I, uh, it for you. 
it's like a data bank. So when you are learning C++ or something else, these are really abstract ideas, but now you are literally dealing with these memories. So this is a memory bank. When I was learning the programming languages, I just don't know what is that. How can you just draw a memory bank? So the data are being <laughs> stored in the registers, diffie flops, okay? And every single bank, every row has an address. And how do you use the address to find out every memory? For example, it's a byte for every byte here, how that works. It's a decoder, right? So the decoder can select each one at one time and take it out. So enable each one uh, at one time. So the data is being selected and you can send it out whenever the clock uh, arrives. And let's come back to this one. Address, A bit address. So the A bit address can give you what uh, depths in the memory. A bit, how many memory bytes? What's the depths in there? So a bit a bit address means you have two to the eighth, right? So which is two hundred fifty six. So there are two hundred fifty six uh, rows in the memory, and uh, you can define the length of the memory by yourself. Usually, if we do a bit memory, is is a, a one byte for each row, and you have two hundred fifty six rows. That's a that's a everything for the memory and data. That's the output of the memory, it's a bit. So what is this? It's a register type, a bit. You haven't used this before, right? So look at that. So the it's an A bit for each row, and it has 256 rows. So you can understand this in this way. So every single variable here is an A bit variable, and there are 256 of these variables in there. It's like a list, right? You have 256 items in the list. So CE chip selection or chip enable and read enable, both of them has to be one at the same time. So this and this, so both have to be one in order to have a one as a result of the end logic, right? So one here, one here, which means the read enable, so it's read is being enabled and also the chip is selected as well. If it's one, then do this. If it's not one, then do this, right? So if it's one, assign the that data in the memory to data. Otherwise, just send a zero to data. And address is a bit, and the depth here is 256, so they match. So what if I have six column zero here? What's gonna happen? What's the problem if I have a six column zero? I only have seven bits for the address, but I have 256 for the depth of the memory. What's gonna happen? You won't be able to access the bottom whatever, how many, the bottom section of the memory, right? Okay. read memory binary so b here means binary so it's a binary memory file so all the numbers in the memory is a binary or it's reading the reading the data from the memory in the binary form um, and that's a memory file you can create a memory file by yourself it's very simple you just create a text 
text file on your uh, Windows and uh, name it, so make the extension to be MEM. And you can open it up in Vim and type all the data in there. Okay. Or it can, you know, for example, like 256 rows, right? You are thinking it's gonna take a lot of time to type it. Actually, actually it's not. Why? Well, you just type one row and you copy and paste, right? Just YYMP, just keep doing that. So I'm gonna need to change some of the numbers, probably just the LSBs or some of the bits over there uh, in order to get different data in the memory. So when you are doing the simulation, you can view these results. Otherwise, you don't know if it's keep taking the same role or is uh, making any mistakes, right? You just need a uh, different data for every role if you can. Okay. So create the memory file by yourself. And so the memory file here is being read into this variable, which is declared in your uh, Verilog code here, right? So that's the data, it's the data, the memory file. And in the monitor, when, whenever you are uh, looking at the simulation result, uh, you can reconfigure the format of the data being displayed in the monitor. So for example, you want the address to be displayed as a hex number. So data, you want a hex number as well, binary, binary, like that. So you can define the data format you want to display in the monitor, in the simulation monitor. Okay. And see, when i is less than 256, just keep adding one to it. So address, so i is directly being sent, uh, being assigned to address and You can see, is that the test bench? Yeah, so this is a test bench, right? Address is being shorted to address, so it's being connected to address inside the module, the ROM module. So where is the ROM module? It's over here, okay? So the address being received, so the number, uh, the number of the address being received by the raw module and it's happening over here. So the memory file, put the address over here and find out the data in the memory file and send it to data. And data is being shorted to the data in the test bench as well. So you can, you can view it in the simulation result. So these are asking you to change the uh, format of the data in a memory file. So for example, you can, you know, create, um, you can use hex, hex numbers in a memory file. But if you are using hex numbers in a memory file, you have to change the read mem h, you know, it used to be b, you read mem b, if you have battery numbers in here, but now these are Hex numbers, you have to use read mem h. Mm -hmm. So one thing I would like to let you know is, um, so making the, the address variable, changing the length of that variable, so some of the examples in the tutorial, you know, are unnecessary, you know what I mean? So I don't have to use, for example, four bits over here, because I only have how many how many data lines over here? Four, right? So I just need a two bits. So I just need a one zero, not three zero for the address. You know, I even used uh, some crazy length for the address. It's totally unnecessary. Just let you know. Don't want to confuse you guys. Okay, so 15 to zero, 16 bits, it's a lot. And I really don't have that many over here. Okay, you don't, have, you don't need that long for the address. And you can separate 
the data, uh, every single data using new lines. For example, in this memory file, I use the new lines to separate the data, every single data. But also you can use space as well. So it doesn't matter actually. So space or new lines doesn't matter. So for the for this kind of data, what's the depth of this memory? 16. Okay. Because I just I just told you space or new lines doesn't matter. They are they can be used as uh, separators for the data in the memory file. So for example, this is address zero, right? I'm getting a b that's the hex hex number and this is going to be address one two three four right it's equivalent so space or new lines they are equivalent separators for the to separate data in the memory file all right <clears throat> The last example in the tutorial, IP blocks, you can create a ROM block from the IP catalog function in uh, Vivado. So click IP catalog, and it's gonna guide you through all these uh, steps to create a ROM module. And here's the, the chip of the ROM. So it has an IP inside the Vivado, so it's free. You can directly use it. The ROM doesn't have any data, it's just a ROM um, registers, right? Being clocked with just a digital block, but there's no data. You have to load the data to it, which is here in this step. So dsimage.coe. So .coe is, is an extension for the data file to be loaded into the ROM IP here. And this file is available on the website. You can directly use it. You can directly download and use it. Just follow the steps and load the uh, data file to the uh, ROM IP in Vivado. And since you instantiate, so you create, you created that ROM block. Uh, it's literally just a module or a chip. So you can you have to instantiate it in your test bench in order to use it. You know, address, clock, data, a bit data. These are the ports for the ROM. And you can, so usually if you don't know what are the names of the ports, you actually have to click it and look at the, uh, expand the menu here and look at the names of the ports. Because if you don't know the names of the ports, you cannot instantiate that module in your test bench. So you have to make the, make the connections in between the, the test bench and also the, the module here. Okay, so this is an open question. I didn't uh, provide the test bench for this example and I have to create the test bench on your own. So it's going to be, a, you can imagine that this one is being clocked. So the ROM is being clocked. So it just need an always block, always at the rising edge of the clock to you know, assign the address to the address line over here and uh, connect your data to the data lines of the ROM and display it in, in your simulation. So you have to create the clock by yourself. You know, you're just flipping that clock line whenever it reaches at a counter's number, right? All right, these are the tasks associated with this tutorial. So do you guys have any other questions from other tutorials from the, from the last one or anything else? No?